Greetings everyone, Anthony Russell here, Banners on the Wall, joined by a very, very special guest. Not a man I generally see popping up doing many of these things, so always thankful for when they take the time out of the day, but a man who has for a good number of years, certainly at least 10 if you're counting in Peter for Phantom's terms in a row, uh, been one of the top defensemen across the across the second tier of, of British ice hockey, whether it's the EPL or whether it's the NHL National Division. I'm joined on the line by a man with a very special event coming up before too long. Peterborough Phantoms defenseman and assistant coach Tom Norton. Tom, thank you for taking some time out of your evening. No, thank you. Um, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's much appreciated. Um, obviously, someone went and speak to me as well, so no, it's nice. Yeah, we finally figured it out. Um, before we kick into kind of the too much of kind of the reminiscing, um, thoughts on the weekend for you? Um, yeah, it was a. Uh... It was a good weekend that we've just had. Um, obviously, never easy to go to Telford and get the win, and they've been in pretty good form. Um, like most teams, we're suffering with some injuries as well and players missing. So, you know, it was one of those ones that we really had to grind out. Um, and again, the night after against the Bees, um, again, a really close game there. Obviously, they're a, a really hard-working team with some really skillful imports. So, you know, they can beat anyone on a given night as well. And again, we have, we have to work for it. but. Um, the weekends don't get any easier. We've got leads back to back this weekend, so um, that'll be a, a fun one and, uh, you know, a game that we always have um, a good battle with leads against as well. So looking forward to it. Yeah, it should be a lot of fun. Anyway, let's go back to the beginning. Uh, you're a Nottingham boy and it only feels right. We have to talk about the first hockey, mem uh, first hockey memory because I assume like a lot of people from Nottingham, it's the old Nottingham Ice, uh, Nottingham Ice, uh, at Lower Parliament Street. Tell us how you tripped over and fell into the game. Um, basically, my dad and my granddad um, took me to a game. Um, it was actually a Benson Hedges Cup final game um, at the Sheffield Arena, it would have been at the time, and it was Panthers versus the uh, Scottish Eagles. Yeah, um, can't tell you really how that came about because I was um, five, six years old, um, but when loved mm. it, um mum and dad then brought me some rollerblades didn't get off them for six months um so they were like right we better put him into ice hockey they ended up finding an ad down at the ice rink with somebody who was looking to sell kit second hand it turned out that that kid had only worn the kit once and then broke his leg and wasn't allowed to play contact sports again um oh. so even though, even though it was second hand it was like brand new kit so that was um, quite nice. And um, yeah, from there, obviously, just did my grades and started playing. But at that time in Nottingham, there was a shortage of um, young young players coming through. So whilst mm. I was doing my hockey grades, I got to play at the same time. So I think after I passed like either grades one, two or three, I was able to then play for what was the Pumas then at the time. And um, mm. it also turned out, um, well, one of my really good friends, James Neal, um, he also played. And we went to the same primary school but oddly enough we didn't know that each other played ice hockey until i turned up at a training session and he was there on the ice and then and then that was it so yeah that was um the earliest memories really and obviously i guess falling in love with the game and yeah. um, what do you remember about going to the panthers for the first time because like i say that's that's a hell of an introduction getting the bn a bnh cup final so, you know, the Steelers are obviously, are, you know, and yeah, Scottish Eagles, obviously not, not here for a long time, but certainly a very Im impactful time. But tell us about that first experience about, about watching the Panthers, if you remember anything about it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the biggest thing that I remember uh, probably from that was obviously the, the Benson Hedges Cup. I don't know, obviously people might have to go and Google it, but it was this um, obviously gold trophy, really nice looking. Mm -hmm. But then all the players, when they won it, they all got a yellow hat. On, on as well that they wore that that's the biggest thing that i am um, i really remember from that um in terms of the old room as well obviously walking up the steps upwards as well was always pretty cool i remember being the a few times and um, trevor robbins being the goalie and um we were always told to um mm -hmm. either get up the stairs or move to the side because he's going to run you over basically because he's that much in the zone so he didn't really care who was in front of him so yeah, most of the time we kind of let uh, Trevor Robbins go first and um, yeah, but uh, one of the times that I was mascot as well because James's dad um, used to manage the uh, the Nottingham ice rink, 
I got there early, mm. so he let me go out on the ice. So before warm up, I was out there beadling round, shooting the pucks, and then probably about 10, 15 minutes later, the Panthers came on the ice, and I was stuck in the corner. And um, Mike Bishop had to pick me up and um, take me to the middle of the ice so I didn't get killed by one of the players. So um, yeah, good experience, good fun, and um, yeah, some great memories at that old ice rink. Yeah, there's a health and safety officer listening to this having palpitations at such a thought i'm pretty sure um i do have to make you feel old but i'm old so you can join in but if you i think back and if your elite prospects obviously doesn't go back quite as far as your the start of your playing journey but it does go back to the 2003 2004 nottingham cougars and blimey did you play with some talented guys not only james neely you've mentioned but robert lakovitz rob farmer richard bentham jack prince uh ben wood as well i think was kind of there that that road through nottingham i mean you talk about the fact there weren't many great up-and-coming youngsters when you first started but by the time you start started hitting under 16s we got some names that are still and you know i think about rob lack of it to me you think you think about the impact he's had in british hockey and for the national team i mean nottingham over the years certainly in the last certainly during my time watching british hockey has just been a fantastic hotbed of junior development why do you think that is these days um i think obviously for for us in terms of that age group we all came through together at that five like say five six years old and um kind of like grew up together i always remember we played our first game against sheffield at their old ice rink uh, which was uh, queen's road i think if i'm right in saying i always remember going up the up the stairs to that one um, and we lost 48 nil in our first game so that was like the likes of, like say, me, Laco, Farmer, Sam Bullis, um, to name a few in in that team when it happened. And um, you know, I guess most players probably at that time, if they got spanked by that many, might um, consider if they still want to keep on playing. Uh, I always remember like the, the star player for that team was um, Danny Wood, um, mm. who did for Sheffield, Sheffield, uh, Sheffield Steelers, yeah, and just. I mean, I couldn't tell you how many he scored, but you can imagine out of 48, it was probably quite a lot. Um, so, so yeah, and it was um, it was kind of from then, then, I guess, as a group, you know, each year we just got better and better, but we were so young. But by the time we got to like our second to last year in under 10s, we started, we started winning. And then the year after, I think we won the league. And then from then on, like the nucleus and everything was together. And you added like Joe Graham into the mix, other players that were then come into play for us because we had such a strong, I guess, like local talent there that, you know, obviously, I guess players wanted to come and play on that strong team and win. So, um, yeah, it kind of then followed us all the way through juniors, really. And, um, you know, I guess then at the same time, you know, we're then playing for conferences, playing for you know, your Englands and obviously then your GBs that happen. And, yeah, and it's, I guess now, I guess the facility really helps because you know it's a it's a great facility down at the NIC. Obviously, the Panthers are playing out there as well, so I mean, that attracts you know kids from all over the city to come and play ice hockey. I guess if they come and watch the Panthers play, so I think now, obviously, I guess we work closely with the Lions in terms of that development pathway with the Phantoms that we set up this year. They've got mm. so many teams. It's just like, you know, I guess for us, it was notice, noticing that you know the gap for them to jump from an IHL one to the league's massive, it's huge. But the gap still from NIHL one to NIHL is so big anyway. But how could we work together to bridge that? But then also potentially some of our fantasy players that play in NIHL two could they then go to the Lions and potentially get some ice there as well and bridge that gap as well? So it's um you know, it's a real working partnership there, I guess and. I think for me, you know, again, there's been lots of good coaches that have obviously given up their time and um, helped to develop the young talent that's down there. So, you know, it's, um, again, a great junior club. And, um, you know, as you still see now that they're one of the strongest in their like, age categories as well and constantly developing players that are either, you know, skating with the Panthers, dressing for the Panthers or going to NIHL teams or you know, representing England or GBs. Mm. Um, I will ask then, in, in that kind of spirit, do we have any particular favourite stories about Matt Bradbury? Matt Bradbury. Um, yeah. So the first time that I actually met Matt Bradbury, um, 
I was doing some um, work experience for an organisation in the inner city of Nottingham. And um, he at the time was obviously working for the NIC doing his urban hockey. So I ended up going to a school to do an event. He was there with his urban hockey and um, obviously we got talking there. But at that particular event as well, there was um, some reading that was supposed to happen with some of the kids. And unfortunately for me, the person that was supposed to be dressed in the big bear costume known as the reading bear didn't turn up. So as you can imagine, yeah. to jump into um, a bear outfit and um, be the reading bear that day. So that was my first uh, first meeting with Matt. To be fair, in terms of uh, in terms of funny stories, I suppose that's more on me. To be fair, um, <laughs> from then obviously I worked with Matt at the ice rink, and then um, I went away with the GB University set up with him to China, and I've gone back a few times and guested for the Lions as well. So you know, it's a, again a, a good, I guess relationship that we've got and um and friendship as well at the same time yeah he's a top man matt bradbury from the uh from the conversations i've had with him but i mean you mentioned of course nottingham juniors the pathway comes up and you eventually end up kind of into the lines what was the what was the big difference you noted in that step from junior hockey into senior hockey because it hits everybody a little bit different some guys can't make that transition some guys do what was the what do you remember then about that kind of stepping away from playing you know playing with kids to playing with men um just the, the size of the players really um again i'm not an overly big person anyway and you can imagine as a 15 16 year old again i wasn't the wasn't the biggest so it was the pure size um difference and you know playing against men going into the corners with them you know how hard the passes and the shots were it was, again it's just that completely different level but again i was kind of fortunate in terms of the lions at the time that they had again a really core nucleus of good players you know chris colgate um oscar whiteman um sort of the whiteman brothers bliss brothers um adam robinson Mo uh, adam levers all these guys so you kind of you kind of came into that team like as a junior with already some really senior players that had kind of played some really good levels so they were really good at taking you under their wing and and helping to develop you but i suppose as a junior coming into that it wasn't then falling on you ultimately to kind of make the impact in the team as well you could kind of feel your way through playing obviously against men and playing in those games because you know those guys have been there and done it and they were the leaders so you know, many other names as well like johnny bell was there as well so really fortunate with having kind of those guys to move into and obviously learn from at the same time yeah the um as you mentioned of course you know a lot of, a lot of folk who come through that nottingham system they maybe don't not everybody quite cracks the the panthers line up in the same way that you did but obviously you did have a decent chance with with the big team the first time if, I, if memory serves me correctly the first season you were with the panthers for any sort of real at least getting an actual game if i'm right mike ellis is the head coach at that point do you remember the conversation about tom you're in do you remember much about that oh yeah um yeah pretty um it's pretty surreal moment and I, I believe the game was against basingstoke was my first game as well um off the top of my head i think it was might be wrong there in the elite league, but, that was a pretty safe way to introduce you into it um, i love it i was, love my club but we were never power hitters in that division unfortunately no 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 but again again like anything when you played in basingstoke you know they could get the job done and, um, and turn you over because you could not take a night off in that bar um for me um i guess might you say mike ellis was the coach um he had a real passion for working with the youngsters and the Brits at the time as well, I guess, because the, the import quota was lower. So he knew that he kind of had to, I guess, work with British players and, and bring them through. And um, it actually turned out that I went away to Morzine in the summer. Um, it was um, like a Panthers trial camp, if that's the right way to call it. So they did, it was, it was um, the first week um, loads of like, young guys went out there and we um we trained played some games worked out everything like that and i guess mike was able then to take a look at us and then the second week the panthers team came out and did their pre-season and i think there was like three spots for players to stay afterwards um 
I think like Jonathan Boxhill might have ended up staying the second week, Julian Smith, Robert Lakovic, they stayed the second week. But um, fortunate enough for myself, I, I guess I made a decent impression because before I left, he spoke to me and said, look, when you're not in college, so October half term, he said, I want you to come and skate with us for the two weeks. And um, I did. And um, I think it was, might have been a midweek game. And um, he kind of said to me, just be, just be near your phone because you might be dressing tonight. And then he texts me. And um, obviously, yeah, it was um, an unbelievable moment. And you know, I, was just, I was just happy to to be there and putting the shirt on for the club that, you know, I'd, I'd watched for so many years and obviously looked up to with players that played there as well. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a real nice moment. And, um, yeah, the way it all happened kind of was was surreal. And the, in the moment, does that does that weigh on you? Because I think there's, there's something to be said for, you know, obviously being a young British hockey player and there's obviously lots of conversations and lots of kids have to kind of move abroad and come back and kids will bounce around from club to club. But you got the Roy of the Rovers-esque style thing. You got, you as a Nottingham kid, got to play for the Nottingham Panthers. Like In that moment, is that something that, I mean, obviously you're nervous, because if you're nervous because you care, but is that, is it anxiety? Is it elation? Does it weigh heavily on you? Because that's, a, you know, in some ways, that's there's no way the jersey gets bigger than in that moment when you're putting on the thing that you, you've you watched and you've wanted to win. And now it's on you to help it win. How does, what do you remember kind of like in that in that moment of actually kind of skating out into this? Is it an, is it a, oh, good, or is it an, oh, you know, oh, what am I doing here kind of thing no I, I, to be fair I just I just embraced the moment um you know at the end of the day I knew I was probably going to have one of the best seats in the house and be sat on the bench and you know, <laughs> I just wanted to I, I just wanted to soak it all in um and just you know fortunately I think I've maybe done like a week and a bit of practice before that point so you know kind of got to know the guys and players like you know Danny Myers Mark Levers and all the on Matt Myers as well, and um, Jeff Woolhouse were there and stuff like that. Were you know really nice and kind of like you know put me under their wings and stuff and took care of me during that time. So yeah, I think I think for me it was just kind of like a surreal moment, like I've said, and just just really just try to enjoy it. Just you know enjoy myself whilst I was out there at warm up and you know just just take in as much as I can from that experience. Look at what the players are doing. And fortunately, obviously the. The game went our way, the score went up, and I remember Mike tapping me on the shoulder and, and saying, Norts, you you're up, you're going out with um going out with Corey next shift, Corey Nielsen. And um I think he, he made a comment that like I think my eyes just went poof. And I was like, Oh my gosh, like, okay, now you know I'm, I'm getting a shift. And it's third period, so I've sat there for a while. Um and I always remember Corey going to me, Oh, what pl- what side do you want to play? And I was like, uh, left. He was like, I play left. You play right <laughs> in a typical Corey Corey fashion. So, um, so yeah, um, and that and that, that was kind of um, that was kind of it. And I guess the the rest of the year still carried on skating when I could around college, and I guess got a few more opportunities to dress and um, I guess have that experience. I think that's that's the main thing. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you do want to play, but you know, at those moments, you have to recognise that you know you're way way far away from having a regular shift there or doing anything like that. So you, you've just got to soak it all up like a sponge and just enjoy the moment and take everything you can from that from that time as well. And, you know, I guess at that time, you know, there was lots of us Nottingham lads getting that opportunity. Like I say, there was obviously Neely had been there from the age of 14. Lacker had started then getting um, getting some games to dress in. Sam Bullis, Joe Graham, myself. I feel like possibly even Ashley Calvert might have um, might have just a game in that time. Mark Hartley, the goalie. So there was a real a real group of us that was kind of coming through together. So we kind of, it was nice as well at the same time. So we were all there practicing together, going through the same, I guess, journey together at that time, which was you know some really fond memories memories with those guys. Yeah. And then. You sort of get farmed out a little bit, and I'm going to have to. Well, I'm going to have to swear towards the Peterborough fans in this room. So, Phantoms fans, you might want to cover your ears for this bit. But of course, you spent a year with the Milton Keynes Lightning, and not just the Milton Keynes Lightning, the proper classic Milton Keynes Lightning: Mick Paul, Lee Jamieson, uh, Michael Farn, Muzzy Wales, Grant McPherson. I 
think they probably had like Glaz Emesic and Lucas Zakopek there as well, if I'm remembering correctly. What do you remember about that year? Well, that was like my first year away from Nottingham. I think I was maybe 20, 21 at the time. Hmm um and again it, it, was, it was a bit it was a bit of a shock for me to get the phone call from paulie really to go and sign there um because i knew how big of a club they were within the epl um you know they'd, they'd won trophies it was only what two years removed i think that they'd won the the league the league as well yeah um like i say so again it, it was um you know a real kind of honor to go and put that shirt on and play for that team with the history that they had there and the players that they signed um i think for me it was a massive massive learning curve um more so the mental side of the game um the ups and downs you know obviously i've been playing regularly for the lions or whatever before week in week in week out you know dressing with the Panthers, but sometimes, like I say, best seat in the house, or it might have been an odd shift here, an odd shift there, or I might have played a little bit more in a game, but, you know, I'd never, I guess, played a full 54, 56 game regular season and had to, you know, manage those ups and downs. And I always speak to the young players on our team, like, you know, it's, you've got your level that you play at, but, you know, when it gets tough or you make a mistake, you don't want to let it you don't want to nosedive you've got to try and manage it and sometimes there's games where it's going to come off and and sometimes it isn't and when it isn't you've got to recognize that and just simplify your game um and i think that was a massive learning curve for me that year because i think i started the year off feeling pretty confident and um and playing pretty well and then it kind of got to i reckon probably like early november christmas through to january time that i struggled and i you know, i was driving by myself there and back as well and you know, I'll be honest with you, I thought I, thought I was going to get sacked. Um, but, you know, thankfully I didn't. And, um, you know, again, I managed to, in my mind, pick my game up a little bit there towards the back end of the season. But when you mentioned those guys in that dressing room, they were so supportive with me. Like I say, you Michael Wales, Tawalski, you know, Ross Green, even as a young guy on the team as well, he was younger than me, Michael Fong, Grant McPherson, Lee Jamieson the whole team such a close group of guys and they like you say really took care of me there and um I, I always just remember having like you know lewis christie i think had a really good conversation with me about it as well and you know, those ebbs and flows and stuff like that and learning how to manage that and you know I'll, I'll always be thankful for how they obviously took care of me there and i think that then kind of helped me then moving forward then for seasons after that in terms of my play in that mental state that I kind of try to play with now. And then of course, the first time, the first time around in Peterborough, because of course it was in it was interrupted. Um because you had a year in Peterborough, you went back and had what was your final year with the uh with the Panthers. I asked this question of Aaron now and I asked the, I asked the question of Aaron now because I never feel that Aaron now got a fair crack at the Elite League. Did you? Yeah, no I, I I think I did. I, I'm under no delusions to to what I was in the elite league, given you know the imports that were being signed in there, and also the British players that were there. I think I was very fortunate to, you know, have that year back in Nottingham. You know, being such a big club. I think it was the year after they'd won the Grand Slam as well. I know some people might not say it was the Grand Slam, but it definitely was the Grand Slam. They because won it all. Them, because yeah. they didn't win all the trophies. That's not how that works. What, they won all three? Math's not your strong point in Nottingham, apparently. Um, what but do you mean? Good, uh... they, won, they, won, they won the league, the playoffs, and the Challenge Cup. Didn't win the conference, though, did they? Oh, no one cares about the conference. Come on. Yeah, no, good year, though. I, I honestly felt as I got a fair a, a fair crack at it. Um, I'd say, you know, sixth, seventh defenceman, you know, that was probably my ceiling, um, you know, especially on a team like Nottingham. Um, you know, possibly I could have gone elsewhere and stuff like that. But at the same time, you know, I had a career in Nottingham that I was kind of working on in terms of behind, play, behind the scenes when I was playing as well. You know, I was getting to 24, 25 and kind of that decision I had to make, really, I guess, that, you know, it, it's tough. It's tough because like anything, you kind of, you do want to keep 
playing and you know play for your hometown club but sometimes you've got to be you've got to be real but you know I'm forever grateful for that kind of final year and opportunity I got because I pretty much did play regular shifts the whole time and there was injuries as well and you know um it was just nice to I suppose have that one real full year of actually playing so no I, I 100% feel I got a fair crack at the whip but you know I hear what you're saying about Aaron you know forever top goal scoring in our league and stuff like that and again it could have been that situation where you know he, he played in Coventry when they were a really good team um mm -hmm. so in terms of his his spots he was getting in maybe in ice time may, might not have obviously lent itself well to him and the same in Sheffield probably but you know, maybe he could have gone to you know a Manchester or another team like that kind of um in kind of middle of the pack kind of team and maybe have had more opportunity there but I guess he wanted to push himself at one of the top teams yeah yes and if we all had wheels we'd be bicycles I suppose is the nature of that sometimes it's just the way the cards the way the cards are dealt but eventually Thanks, summer man. of 2014 rolls around and Slava Kulikov is ringing you on the telephone at least I assume it was Slava and the start of what we know now which is Tom Norton Peter Profantum tell us about that first conversation with Slava because obviously geographically Peterborough worked really, really well for uh, for you, uh, being being Nottingham based. But you probably, when you become available as sort of a young defenseman like that, stepping away from the elite league, there's a couple of teams geographically that would have been an option for you. So how did Slava convince you to go to go to the Phantoms? Well, it actually rang me the year before because uh, I think I'd signed back in Peterborough and then Panthers came after I signed. I think been some changes in the team and a spot opened up so it was like an opportunity i couldn't couldn't not take but he rang me that same year when he was in slough um and asked me to All go right. down there but again I'd say geographically it would have just been not possible and like say i had a job also alongside playing hockey in nottingham that i wanted to keep doing so again it just wasn't going to work unless i moved down there so um and then the year after um, again, he'd gone to Peterborough and he rang me, but I'd actually signed a two-year deal in Nottingham. Um, so at that point when he rang me, I kind of had to say, look, I've signed a two-year deal. Um, I've kind of not had any contact from Panthers yet to say if they want me for that second year. But, you know, if they don't, um, you'll be the first person I call because I knew it worked around my life before and I enjoyed my time there. Um, Panthers did then say they wanted me for the second year um but then the um a few what if it was a few weeks later or a month later then they up the import quota and um you know i kind of looked at it and unfortunately the spot that i guess i would have been playing in you know another import would have been coming in so players would have got knocked down the pecking order and i was just like you know what i think that's it for me um i've enjoyed it um but you know i want to kind of just go and play now and obviously enjoy it i didn't really fancy um you know potentially a 24 25 year old going all the way to you know your edinburgh and glasgow's and stuff like that and potentially not getting shifts and everything like that and then having to to get up for work on a monday morning i was just like look this probably isn't going to suit my life now going forward and you know the panthers were great about it and corey was great about it and understood it and i pretty much then rang slava i rang slava back and said look i'm i'm not gonna I'm going to be getting out of my contract in Nottingham. Um, is that position still available in available in Peterborough? And I think he said, you know, let me check. And within the next day, he called back and it was contract done and I was back there. So it was pretty quick, really. It wasn't the worst first season in Peterborough, all things considered, given how it ended the 2014-15 season. The playoff title in your first at the first attempt. Um when I chatted to Will Weldon about this around the time of his testimony, he remembered that he remembered that time very fondly. What are your memories of that one? Because if I'm certainly as a senior, that's your first that's your first trophy, isn't it? Um, no, I'd won the I was part of the Challenge Cup team the oh, year you before. Did, did. You won the Challenge Cup. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. my bad. Yeah, no, that, that, no, that's fine. Um, but yeah, um, I guess. For us, there was a lot of change that had happened when Slava came in. Mm. A lot of new players, a lot of new faces. I remember saying to him when he signed um, Eddie Bebris, I was like, you've signed a 
a real good player there. And I guess he, he knew that anyway. But I remember being an MK playing against him and it just been a nightmare to play against. Um, mm. But yeah, you could just tell like, you know, there was something, I think there was a slow start to the year, but then it just slowly built. And that kind of like, you know, I guess everybody bonding together as a team, but kind of like, you know, what we were as a team as well was starting to come through. And obviously, you know, having Yanis um, in between the pipes as well helped massively because he could effectively win you a game on his own. He was unbelievable. And I mean, what a find he was, um, you know, and I guess for, forever in Peter will be a, I guess a legend of a goalie there because he was he was fantastic along with his temperament as well. Um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, um, it, it just seemed to all build like especially after Christmas, you just felt it was going in the right direction, and we just peaked at the right time. And I mean, you, you look at the team that we had, and we kind of look back at the like, three forward lines that we had in the final, and it was like you know there were three really good forward lines, but then you know as a defence core, we were all really young. Um, apart from sorry about this, apart from Jason Putman, obviously he was a he, he, he was he was a little bit older, but like you say, there was like, you know myself, Robbie Feds, uh, Cam McGiffin, Scott Robson, um, Greg Pick, and then Jason Butman, because uh, I think unfortunately James Hutchinson got injured and ended up not obviously playing out at the end of the year. Um, so we were really young. Um, so, but yeah, it was just a a real unbelievable moment, I guess. A, a bit of an underdog, an underdog story, especially beating Telford in that semi-final game as well. And of course, you got to play in what was the final game of Tony Hand, arguably the greatest British player to ever lace up a pair of skates and sent sent him out looking at the lights, as it were. Was it when you think about it from the other side of it though? Because I mean, certainly, it, certainly one of the things that they they say, you know, they talk about kind of going up, going out on top, but. The one thing I was thinking about looking looking back on this was because I was reflecting on it earlier today that in some ways it would have been nice it would have been a nice ending for the story but I almost don't feel like they, he like he didn't need to win it was just kind of the celebration was of the fact that he'd made it all the way to the to the end of the season but for for you guys I assume that the whole point was going out there and you're not yes he's playing but you don't really worry about a guy like that having a big moment you're there to do your job. Exactly, exactly. And I think in a disrespectful way, I think Wells might have said the same thing. We we came out against Manchester, I just didn't feel like we were going to lose. I don't, I don't it, we, there was just that feeling within the group, like, I don't know if kind of like, like I say, no disrespect, that Telford game was like the cup final and we'd, we'd done it. And it was just like all confidence and momentum then was just straight into Manchester. And yeah, I don't you know, I guess, unfortunately, I guess, like you say, Tony would have probably loved to have signed off with a with a trophy, but, you know, he's won plenty enough in his career as well. So, you know, it, it was what it was. But it, was nice. it was nice, I guess, that, you know, he was able to have that moment as well on the, on the in the middle of the ice and be applauded and stuff like that, quite rightly so as well. The, um, I asked, I had, I've had this conversation with you before off air. I've had this conversation with Will Weldon when I interviewed him. I've had it with Phantoms fans, left, right and centre. I've had it with fans of other teams, left, right and centre. So I'm going to ask you the question in a slightly different way because I don't think people need to hear me hear the same question asked multiple times. Do you understand, if you take yourself out and look at the flip side of the argument, do you understand why people are critical of the style of play that Slavers coaching produces and why people don't like watching it? Um, certainly for away fans, I guess, when we've, especially when we go to away, away, away rinks, um, you know, at the end of the day, we're not there to entertain you guys, um, nope. when we're in away rinks, but, you know, at the end, I think, I think what Slava worked out was for us to be successful, um, we had to stick to a plan and we had to be tactically really sound to do that because especially in the EPL days, you know, let's say we were we were below probably mid-table budget. So, mm. you know, when he was signing players and stuff like that, it was making sure he got the right guy, one that could obviously fit within the system and obviously understand what he wants to play and how he wants to play it. You know, so it was never going to be the case that 
I suppose in his mind that we'd be able to push for a league title because because we wouldn't have the the strength of players or the depth there. But you know, like you say, these cup competitions and these playoffs as well, they're a real opportunity for us because they're kind of like one off games, aren't they? Where you know you can make it happen. Mm-hmm. And everybody's clicking and buying in on that one night. Anybody can beat anybody. So, um, but I, I will have to say, Slava has got way, way more creative and offensive over the ten years that I've been with him now. Like the, the free roam that kind of myself as a defenseman has been able to have, and also deactivating down low, jumping into the rush, everything like that. You know, he's really tried to add that into the game and obviously allow us to do that. Um, so I think as he's progressed through his years, he's also progressed more offensively. Don't get me wrong, you know, the D zone comes first and the trap and how he wants us to play and stuff like that. But kind of once we get over that blue line into the offensive zone, players have got kind of free roam to kind of be as creative as they want, really, and obviously within the within the system. Hmm. I think certainly there, there's something to be said particularly over time and i think there's a couple of players that immediately spring to mind um and it's um it's lucas Slavkovsky and ralph Sanis, of course who you have on the roster now where actually they'd played elsewhere and had kind of been expected to do so much and certainly in ralph's case when he was in go- in gospel with the devils he was he essentially could kind of do whatever he wanted in whatever way he felt like it um but never kind of got the opportunity at that kind of higher level. And Slykovsky, of course, was in Romford, and it seemed like he was expected to kind of have all the ideas and make it all up himself, and he could never quite piece it all together. But they kind of, the one thing that Slava's structure to the game has actually kind of done is, it, and it's not to sound horrible, but he's taken a chunk of the thought away from some guys, and that takes away some of the pressure because they know what they have to do. And they they know where they know where the walls are, and the, if you know where your walls are, you've got freedom kind of within your within your space to kind of do something. And that's arguably, certainly, I think, in the case of Sadkovsky, made him a much better player in this division. One hundred percent. It's it's accountability as individuals. You know, everybody knows their role within the team, what's expected of them. You know, and you know, like I say, how we are structured in a trap, in the D zone, you know, even on, even in the offensive zone, like set plays that we do there, you know, you can pinpoint where like maybe someone could be in a different position or, you know, maybe where it's fallen apart and the mistakes have happened, which has led to goals, but it's all around accountability. And, you know, there's, I think there's been quite a few players that, you know, have come to, come to Peterborough and left as better players because of that. Don't get me wrong, it's not every player's cup of tea, and some no. won't somewhere like that because maybe they've had the freedom before and that's how they've always liked to play. But certainly in, you know, I suppose you can really look in Lucas's case over the last two seasons, you know, his production in terms of scoring and points and stuff like that and his overall play compared to probably how it was in Romford is, you know, way better. Um, I guess because it's kind of suited his style. Um and I guess that's just how it is. And you see it in all sports with players moving to different clubs and potentially just finding their place and how they fit. Mm. Is Slava aware that there are fans, uh, particularly this, particularly when Peterborough win on the road, is he aware that people talk about about their team getting slavered? <laughs> I've I would imagine possibly so. I mean, he, he, he takes great, he takes great pride in his in his preparation, and you know he's he's got his little notebook, and every game is is writing in it before the game. He's got all his notes. He's at home games, the whiteboard's covered in stuff. His meetings are all well planned and prepared. You know, videos in the week. You know, we have video sessions in the changing room. If there's not time though, we get videos sent into the WhatsApp group and stuff like that. So. In terms of like, you know, you're looking at it as a semi-professional team, but the coach mm. is fully professional with how he's running it and how he wants everybody to, to be ready for the weekend. I mean, if he could have us there, you know, four, three days a week and have time to do that kind of stuff, he 100% would. But unfortunately, obviously, it doesn't lend itself to that. But, no. you know, he's, 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 he knows he's got to do it like that because if he wants us to be competitive and he wants us to challenge, you know, in the league or be a competitive team in the league or be going for the cups this is how we need to set ourselves up and this is how we need to play 
I need to drop us down to a low, but I promise we'll come back up to a high afterwards. No problem. It's the last game of the 2017-18 regular season against Streatham. Talk me through what happened and then talk me through the aftermath. So that would be the year that Basingstoke won the league. And I think it was on the fifth, might have been the fifth decider or something the ridiculous tie, like that. The fifth tiebreaker. Yeah. Unfortunately, you guys were, if my memory serves me correctly on this one, you were 4 0 up against Streatham, let them back in. 1-6-4 on the night basis. It's like 1-10-1 against Invictus and it meant all they needed was a win in Cardiff against a team that had not won the entire season. Um, but yeah, there's a... Because it was... it And the thing is, of course, is that the league title is the thing that's eluded not just you, but Peterborough, your entire core, and you were literally within like a diet Rizzler's worth of getting there. Yeah. Um... Again, one of those ones where you sit back and kind of scratch your head, I think, as well. A credit to Basingstoke. Um, I think they had Swindon quite a few times in that back end of the season. And again, we were like, surely Swindon will beat them. They'll beat them. And they just couldn't. And, you know, it's one of those things you shouldn't rely on. You, you shouldn't rely on other teams to to beat a team to get yourself in because, you know, clearly we'd had a couple of slip-ups against some teams within the year as well. So... You know, I, I remember us needing a lot of goals against Streatham, and um, I believe the media team at the time um, was very much about publicising that, and I think it might have rubbed some of the Streatham players up the wrong way. Um, so, you know, they came... You got they came Cornish up the wrong way, having had that conversation with him. With who, Sorry. Jeremy Cornish it rubbed up the wrong way, of course, was coaching Streatham at the time. And you don't rub Jeremy Cornish up the wrong way, is there a life lesson, I feel? No, and and, and in fairness, they were, even though they were, what, an NIHL one South team before, and obviously we dropped down, they were still a good team in that league and they had some good players. And last, I think it um, obviously lit a bit of a fire because, you know, it then obviously we didn't score as, um, as many goals and um, the, rest is, the rest is history. And I think, Basically, Stoke went to Cardiff Fire with their final league game of the season, I think. And um, obviously, that was kind of inevitable, really, what was going to happen there. So, yeah, it's um, it's tough because we've been close quite a few times. Um, but it's been fun to be in those battles as well and being in, in and amongst it. Yeah. And then, of course, as I said, we will bring you back up because the Cup just seems to be a competition in which you guys thrive. Didn't quite go as well this year because Swindon decided to run the table right at the end. But the Autumn Cup, I mean, the National Cup final last, uh, last year over the two legs, I mean, talk about an absolute seesaw barn burners worth of 120 minutes worth of hockey to get over the line in a, in that one. But it does feel a little bit like, I mean, you mentioned earlier about the fact that anybody can kind of win in, in, on any given night. Uh, 60 minutes is easier to win than six months in some ways. But you guys, as a, as and you've had a core, quite a strong core for quite a number of years. But is this a, is this a fact that sometimes with hockey, because there's that playoff mentality, even though the league is the most important prize in this country, there's just something in in hockey players' heads of it's on the line right now, and you just kind of really turn up and show up in the death because it does seem to be a speciality with you guys. I think if you spoke to any hockey player, the hardest thing to do is is win and win a trophy. And it doesn't happen very often. Um, in Peterborough over the 10 year span, I think I've been part of five teams that the, five teams that have won the trophies that, that, that we've won. Um, and there's plenty of guys in the league that, you know, maybe haven't won one. Um, so, you know, you, it's it's one of them where, like you say, when you know you're kind of in touching distance, and it's like like, like you say, it's a game or a two-legged game. Is is kind of like you know, it's playoff hockey, but in a cup in a cup series. You know what I mean? Um, but in terms of the league league as well, I think not only does obviously one having the right team and everything like that, and the consistency. You know, there's a bit of luck involved in that. There's also injuries, um, and having and having that, and I think. That's really, really important, and you know, like I say, I suppose 
these teams over the years that have been able to do that because of that um and obviously probably greater budgets and stuff like that in terms of depth and, and covering but you know that's that's the league and that's how it works and it's the same in same in same in football really effectively you know so and of course you are now closer to the end of your hockey career than you are the start of it and you have made this transition into into being a coach as well you are you know you are the assistant coach at the phantoms what's that move been like for you because ultimately i mean hockey's a short career anyway it wasn't that really in grand terms it wasn't that long ago when you started being an adult player if we're if we're honest you know you're not you're definitely not the oldest player you're not the oldest player in the league by quite some distance uh you, um but you're moving into this idea of you know taking more responsibility of course peterborough has oh, certainly at least in the last couple of years been much better about bringing some of these younger guys through what's it like trying to coach this lot it all came around i guess when we when we dropped down to the nihl on south and Slavi just wanted a little bit more extra help with stuff and you know i was already part of like the I guess the leadership group within the team anyway so you know it was and he was always speaking to me about that kind of stuff so it was kind of seamless in terms of the transition there and i guess just being able to help him with that defensive side of the game and obviously you know pass on some learnings from that to the younger guys and you know preparations before the games you know this <laughs> i'm sure my wife will tell you there's some nights where you know and I'm sure guys will know being on the phone to Slava can sometimes um, you'll say it'll only be 10 minutes and you're there an hour later still talking. So, um, <laughs> you know, there's 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 that to add on to it as well. And I think it's it's good for him to know that, you know, he's got somebody that he can sound off to as well and speak to in, in the team. Um, for me, again, it's been really a really big learning curve as well, trying to manage that alongside playing as well. Um, mm. And obviously trying to obviously one obviously look after my own performance but then try and watch the performance of others and give give feedback where i can as well or help and support with that so but in terms of i guess coming towards the end of my career as well you know i guess we'll see we'll see where it all kind of goes after that um i've certainly enjoyed the the coaching aspect and the stuff that slav has allowed me to kind of get involved in and be a part of as well but I'd like to think maybe I've got a couple of more years left in me yet before I, I, I even consider something like that. Drew Cam still playing Division One at forty-seven. You're fine. Um, what is your? Um, do you have any particular philosophy when it comes to coaching in terms of like in like in, not just in sort of say you know because obviously the X's and O's of hockey are what they are, but do you particularly have a philosophy with how you try and get that message into people? Because of course the big thing that you need is buying something really if we're honest you don't really struggle from a great deal in peterborough because you kind of have to buy into what slavers what slavers putting out or you don't hang around for very uh, for very long but how do you you obviously get a message from him how are you trying to impart that into the guys in the blue line court i think obviously it's it's i've been there so long that i kind of know kind of what he's what he's he trusts me in that respect as well in terms of, I guess, like oh dear. shouting or anything like that, it's kind of more conversation based. Um, I like to kind of set the question as well, see what they thought in that situation as well, and kind of have it as more of a I guess a chat back and forth. And then it's kind of like, oh, did you maybe see this, or what did you think of that kind of thing? So you know it's kind of working together on that point um you know and, and vice versa you know if they see something that i do because you know at the end of the day i'm still playing i'm still making mistakes you know they can give me the heads up about that i think it's it's good to be able to talk to each other and either have, have those relationships and and kind of build on that as well and you know someone like callum callum buglas he's um he's kind of adding a little bit more into that into his game as well and giving his his thoughts on things and what he sees as well which is obviously really great to see scott robson he um he works on the pk side of stuff with um with will weldon um so father likes to give guys ownership whilst overseeing he likes to give mm -hmm. guys ownership so like you know like say will and robbo will kind of speak to him about how the pk could potentially be set up how it works paddy with the power play so it kind of works like that so 
players have got input, which for me then gives more buy-in. And also it gives a different voice within the dressing room instead of it just being Slava up there talking the whole time, you know, other players feeling like they can be heard or give their input. Okay, I'll ask the question, although like you say, you've got a few years left in you by your, by your reckoning. But 10 years, technically 11, of course, with one team. What's the legacy of Tom Norton? Oh, gosh. Um, I wasn't expecting that question. And again, I've not really, um, <laughs> not really thought about it. Not really thought, not really thought about that because, like I say, it's, I'd like to think I'm a few years still away from that. But I'd like to think that, you know, I'll leave the game as somebody who was seen as, you know, a hardworking player, um, somebody who was hopefully seen as a as a good teammate on the team. And um, I suppose for me, if, you, if you're playing somewhere for that length of time, I guess, you know, was willing to kind of do anything for the team that would help them to win. Um, you know, personal accolades and stuff like that are great, but it's always the ones that you do with your teammates like winning cups or you know battling through big games where you where you pull out a win they're they're, they're the ones that matter and that's what you will you'll, you'll always remember so um yeah i mean if, you might have to ask me ask me that one back when actually you know i suppose I've, I've sat there and thought thought about kind of my hockey career and kind of where it's all gone but kind of at this moment in time kind of that's what i'll probably be looking for as we edge towards the end I'll do what I usually do, which I'll ask a few sort of shorter-ish questions. So let's see what you think of them. Why number two? Um, so I didn't pick my number. Um, again, Corey Nielsen's first year as a head coach, um, did the um, pre-season with the team and everything like that. And then we had an open training session. So we were all in the middle stretching and then players were being announced one by one to go and get their shirt and put it on and if i'm honest i didn't even expect to get a shirt i was again just just happy to be there and um and taking part and um yeah my name got called and um there it was number two it was um adam goodridge that picked it and that was it i've, I've stuck with it ever since i grew up playing number 16 or number six mostly but from that point on i was like two it is Best player you've ever played with? Wow. Um, I think more because, oh my gosh, that's really tough. If I'm going defenseman, um, for me, two players that, you know, for me, obviously, I kind of learned a lot from and probably looked up to as a player. Probably looking at like Jonathan Weaver and obviously Corey Nielsen at the same time. The, the time that he put in to kind of help to develop me and support me as well, obviously, was was massive through my my younger years as well. So um yeah, definitely those two as a defenseman. And then I mean, some of the some of the imports in Nottingham, obviously like Alexandra Beauregard, Jay Galbraith, um on a two-way at the time there was david ling as well like unbelievable players that i suppose you can't really look past david clark as a british forward as well mm -hmm. just his mentality work ethic you know how much he wanted to win and and be the best you know you just you just have to sit back and watch it. and when i say about kind of like absorbing like a sponge and sponge and watching players and how they are and how they act and what they do to kind of be the best he was definitely a prime example of that. Best player you've played against? Oh my gosh. Best player I've played against. Oh, best player I've played against. Um, you really put me on the spot with this one. That's literally the point. Yeah, yeah, there's there's so many. So many. Um I 
I think for me, um, I look back at kind of somebody like during that time when I was in Nottingham and stuff like that, like Jeff Legui, how good they were in Sheffield, Rod Sarich, like again, un unbelievable players. And again, to sit there, best seat in the house watching them play or potentially beagle out there and get a shift against them, you know, that was again, some, some real, so, yes, yeah, I mean, there was like Carlson at Coventry, Adam Calder at the time when they were like lighting up the league as well, like unbelievable players. Uh, watching football or watching hockey? I actually really struggle with watching hockey. Um, yeah, because I, I, I think it's one of those things I'd rather play than watch. Um, so it'd probably be yeah. um, it probably it probably be football, but it has to be has to be live and obviously at the city ground as well. Watching Forest if I'm watching. Um. Play with Wayne Gretzky in his prime or 10 minutes to chat to Brian Clough? Wow. Really thought about these, haven't you? Um, I really haven't. Again, I think, <laughs> you, you know what? I think, yeah, again, with hockey, it, it has to be play alongside Wayne Gretzky. I mean, He'd probably look back at me and think, what the hell are you doing out there? Like, you know, but, um, yeah, to, be, to share the ice with Wayne Gretzky would obviously have been unbelievable. Yeah. And of course, probably the big reason why we're, talk why we're talking, because we have timeless, of course, folks, given the fact that the announcement is, is out. Tickets, of course, are on sale for the Tom Norton testimonial on the 25th of May at Planet Ice Peterborough. There's a lot going on around, around this. So for folk that want to get involved because you you're off there's a bunch of different things that are kind of on offer as well there's 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 glow golf there's a few things you can kind of pay for to kind of get involved with the, with the game itself as well as turning up so give give people give people the spiel why why should they come down and get involved tom I, well i hope it's going to be a really fun night i've got lots of um fun stuff planned on the evening um lots of um lots of obviously past players coming back which hopefully People want to see not just not just from Peterborough as well. Obviously, there'll be players that I played with in Milton Keynes, played with the Panthers as well that are that are kindly agreeing to come and play, which is obviously you know really kind of them to come and support me and obviously play in my testimonial. Um, but like I say, hopefully it should just be all around just a really really fun night. And I mean, I've been blown away by the support that I've had from. From the fans and obviously the, the the club as well in terms of putting this all together in terms of the the fan engagement stuff that i had so like the gm roles head coaches um equipment manager that like they've all sold out we had a player experience as well so fans i think two fans can play as well in the in the game so that's sold all the sponsorships so it's 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 unbelievable and then like you know a, a sponsor then to be able to say to me yeah we'll, we'll host an event for you so obviously like you say i've got the glow golf event the night before which for me i wanted to do something that would involve families so you know like i say they can all come and be involved in it and hopefully have a fun night as well um so yeah um i didn't expect it to kind of be like you're always a little bit worried and you're thinking oh are people going to want to be involved are people going to want to come like but yeah, it's um, obviously really, really, really surreal. Obviously blown away by the support. Hopefully over the next couple of weeks, um, I'll be getting the GMs on a team's call to do the draft. So they could, they'll get to see all the players who are involved. They can draft the teams. And the shirts will be going out for owning loans and stuff like that. So there's still there's still a lot of work to do. But um, yeah, just, just really looking forward to uh, spending time with them, um, you know, current former teammates that I've played with and you know in front of the fans that have been so generous and obviously you know spent a lot of money and showed a lot of care for the club whilst I've been there for the 10 years so hopefully it's a good night for all if you've made if you've somehow managed Yanis Allison's back for this I will laugh myself silly uh tickets are 10 pounds for adults five pounds for children 27 pound 50 for a family of four so that's sad that's a uh, the 25th of May, Planet Ice Peterborough tickets are available, I believe, probably through the Planet Ice ticketing system. Face-off yep. is 4.15pm. Uh, all the best for the rest of the season. Tom Norton, thank you for your time.
No, thank you for having me. Appreciate it.